Say what you will about this NASCAR season, about how it's been oh, boring because it's just Kevin Harvick and Kyle Busch winning all the time. Say what you will, but I gotta say, it's pretty impressive to see how the two of them just answer each other. I mean, uh, Kevin Harvick wins, next week Kyle Busch wins. Next week Kevin Harvick, Kyle Busch wins. I mean, Harvick wins three in a row, Kyle Busch wins three in a row. It's, it's impressive. <laughs> How's it going everybody? My name is Eric and welcome to Out of the Groove. Special Memorial Day edition where we will remember the fallen heroes of our country while also talking about a little bit of racing because Sunday had a ton of racing, not just NASCAR. We're going to mostly focus on the NASCAR, but it's a great day of racing. Indy 500 went to Will Power. I didn't watch any of the F1 Monaco race. I was not up that early. I think Ricardo won. I don't know. And then Kyle Busch basically dominated. And I mean just slapped everyone else across their face and put them in their place type of dominated, just dominated the Coke 600. And today I'm going to talk about the race. I'm going to talk about a lot of the surprises because there are a lot of surprises. I mean, Kyle Busch kind of leading from start to finish wasn't like, it wasn't super thrilling, not a lot of surprises there, but there were a lot of other surprises and a lot of interesting runs, a lot of strong runs from people and a lot of uh, interesting trends that were broken this weekend. So I want to talk about some of those and uh, thanks for being here. So firstly, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the race itself. I'm not going to give like a real hard synopsis, but I just want to talk a little bit about the race. The race in a nutshell, first 200 laps, you saw a decent amount of passing, not really for the lead, but you saw a lot of passing throughout the pack, more passing than I think we're used to seeing on mile and a half races these days. So I was pleasantly surprised by that. Restarts were wild. You had three wide, four wide racing. It was intense. Great, 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 great restarts. You had Kevin Harvick trying to come from the back of the pack after missing qualifying and he quickly drove up into the top 10, top five before blowing a tire. So you had the drama of Kevin Harvick, a heavy favorite, getting knocked out early. You had that spin where Jimmy Johnson got into Denny Hamlin, spun Johnson around. Logano got spun. Jones got a little bit of damage as well. You saw incredible driving, the fact that that wreck it was not a massive 20 car pileup. I don't know how it wasn't. You had Johnson sideways blocking two lanes in the middle of the corner with three wide packs of cars coming after him and no major damage to anybody. I don't know how that happened. But anyway, you had exciting things like that throughout. So the first half of this race, even though Kyle Busch led almost the entirety of it, was very exciting, was great. It was a very good mile and a half race. One of the best mile and a half races we had this year. But unfortunately, the second half of the race, you know, we still saw Kyle Busch dominating, but unfortunately all the things that made the first half exciting just did not happen in the second half. We saw a lot less yellow flags. We saw a lot longer green flag runs. We didn't see as much passing because I think at that point the best cars had already made it to the front and the worst cars were stuck in the back so there wasn't as much comers and goers as we had seen in the first half of the race. So the second half was, it was a snooze fest, let's be real. I do think people were somewhat overly critical of the race as a whole on social media. I thought a lot more people were like, this is terrible. We should have the all-star race package and blah, blah, blah. And to be honest, I do kind of agree. I think that the all-star race package is better than the current mile and a half package, but I was very pleasantly surprised to see. I thought this Coke 600 would be a much worse race than it was. I thought it was gonna be like a three out of 10. It ended up being probably a five or six out of 10, which is not bad. It can, it's doable, it's an average, it's a good, solid NASCAR race. But a lot of fans were not happy with that. A lot of fans, I think, were spoiled by the 90 laps of intense side-by-side -side pack racing action we saw in the All-Star race and thought, that's what we gotta have for 400 laps or it's not a good race. And I never said that, I just said that perhaps that type of racing, that pack racing, is better than what we've seen on most mile and a halfs this year. Uh, but this Charlotte race was better than I thought it would be. I don't know what they did to the cars, if it's the track itself being a night race, being a track with consistent 24 degree banking in the corners, not like how Texas has two different tracks or how some other tracks have progressive banking. Charlotte's just your standard 24 degrees all the way up. Maybe that just is still works with these cars and NASCAR didn't need to change them too much. I mean, you could actually catch cars and pass them when you got to them. It's not like you would just hit a bubble of air once you got within a couple car lengths of them and couldn't get past them. No, give it a lap or two maybe. You have to work them a little bit, but then you can get by most anybody if you're faster than them. So I thought that was a great, I thought it was good racing. But of course, some people don't like it. Uh, I mean, I still think that they should go ahead and put the all-star race package on a lot of tracks until they can figure out a way to get the plates off, keep with the aero ducts, keep with all the stuff. I talked about all this last week. I'm not going to, going to go into it again. Again. But, uh, you know, I, I think people were being a little too hard, a little unfair to the Coke, Coke 600, and I feel like maybe I helped contribute to that by saying how much I like the All-Star Race. I didn't, I don't want people to think that the All-Star Race is the only way we can have good racing. I think people have sh too short of memories. People also tend to think, like, we want the good old days of racing back. We want the good old days where, like, it was way back in the 70s and 80s, and, you know, we basically got that this weekend at Charlotte with the leader winning by... 10 seconds and with you know only nine cars on the lead lap that's basically how it was in the olden days and now fans are saying oh that's still not good enough old fans new fans all fans are saying that's not good enough 
I just don't get it. There's no pleasing a lot of NASCAR fans, and that is a tough thing for the sport. That's why the sport's been such limbo the last 15 years, because the sanctioning body doesn't exactly know what the fans want because the fans don't have a clear consensus on what they want. They're split on literally every issue. And we're not talking like an 80-20 split where like the vast majority want this and the others don't. No, we're talking basically 50-50 on just about every issue. So NASCAR really can't win. And I thought that's what we saw this Coke 600. So let me talk about the actual race. Enough with that. I want to talk a little bit about Toyota because I think this was the first race of the season that the Toyotas looked dominant. I mean, not only with Kyle Busch winning the race, but you had Truex finishing second, Hamlin finishing third, and honestly, Eric Jones ran top five for a lot of the race. If not for a couple of random pit road mishaps, Eric Jones would have probably had a top five run as well. So the Toyotas, JGR, Furniture Row looked really good. It reminded me of kind of the end of last season when the Toyotas looked as strong as they did. This is a season that's been dominated primarily by Ford, primarily by Stuart Haas Racing, and uh, this, this is the first race where we didn't really see Stuart Haas Racing dominate. I mean, Harvick may probably had a good car, but then wrecked, and then we never really saw Boyer, Kurt Busch, Almarola. They'd occasionally poke their nose in that top five, but they were never really serious top two or three contending cars. The Toyotas were. So I thought that was very interesting. Obviously, credit's got to go to Kyle Busch. It's his fourth win of the season. So now Harvick has five wins, and Kyle Busch has four. Nine of the 13 races this year, points-paying races, have been won by those two drivers. I think it's clear to say that we have our two championship favorites. As far as my predictions went last week, I picked Harvick to win the race. He obviously did not win the race, wrecked out, but he had a good car. But my other two big three predictions were Kyle Busch and Martin Truex. They finished top two. So those two Toyotas looking good. Moving on, the big team I want to talk about in this episode is Hendrick Motorsports. I know, we've talked a lot about Hendrick Motorsports this year. Usually it's been about how they've disappointed. But today, actually, I want to talk about how Hendrick Motorsports pleasantly surprised me and exceeded my expectations Saturday, Sunday night after really an abysmal qualifying effort. I, Hendrick Motorsports showed up on Thursday when they had qualifying, and all four of their cars qualified outside the top 20. And that was just... It was, it, was, it was abysmal. I mean, Hendrick Motorsports looked bad right off the truck. But I was very... Pleasantly surprised when I saw Jimmy Johnson quickly drive up into the top 10 in, Saturday, in Sunday's race. I keep saying Saturday. But Jimmy was up in the top 10. Alex Bowman was consistently in the top 15 pretty quick. William Byron, I know, wrecked pretty early and was out of the race, so I'm going to kind of not talk about him as much. But even Chase Elliott. Chase Elliott got up there, was running in the top 10 for a decent amount of the race. He was a little more inconsistent, had some top 5 moments, but mostly it was around 10th to 15th. I mentioned last week that Chase Elliott was my biggest disappointment for the week, and not because I thought he was going to be terrible, but like last year he finished 2nd at Charlotte and ran top 5 at almost every uh, intermediate track. I expected him, and I said it in the episode, to run 8th to 12th, and he ended up finishing 11th, and that's so I was basically spot on there, and that's not a bad race from Chase Elliott or Hendrick Motorsports. It's just it's disappointing when compared to last year. But Jimmy Johnson finally showed an example of why he's a seven-time champion. Started mid-pack, worked his way up methodically, made some impressive moves. Jimmy was driving aggressive. I hadn't seen that from him in a long time. Up in the top five and whatnot. Then on that restart I mentioned earlier where he got turned by Hamlin in an incident that I'm going to go and blame mostly on Jimmy Johnson. People were saying, ah, oh, Hamlin sucks because I think people still hate Denny Hamlin from Martinsville. But if you let that bias slip out of your mind and actually look at this incident, uh, Hamlin, it was a little bit of an aggressive move, but he was there. Jimmy had plenty of time to change his lane and move out of the way and not wreck himself and Hamlin, but Jimmy spun himself. So anyway, Jimmy Johnson was running top five, spun himself out, and still managed to come back and get a top five finish. It was a great, it was it was as close to a championship level performance we've seen from the 48 car in a long time. So I gotta say, I was optimistic, but then I did a live stream last night. I was just, after the race, I was just chatting with fans and stuff in the, in the chat and everything, and I noticed a lot of fans seemed to really be at least a lot of you guys seem to really be high, like, this is it, Hendrick Motorsports is back. We're back in business, baby, woohoo! And I said it then, and I'll say it again now, let's take a small step back. It's a small victory for Hendrick Motorsports. I mean, at the end of the day, they had Alex Bowman finishing ninth, they had Jimmy Johnson finishing fifth, and they had Chase Elliott in 11th. That's not a bad day. But none of those cars ever contended for the win. None of those cars were anywhere close to the level of the top two or three Toyotas. So let's take a small step back and really look at what we saw. The Hendrick cars were good. Chevy in general was not too bad. Larson had moments. Even Newman was up there near the top five before he had issues. Austin Dillon had an issue. So, you know, you had Chevy's had an up and down day, but as far as the ones that actually were able to run consistently throughout the field, I mean, Hendrick Motorsports, yeah, this was their best race of the season. But we are 13 races in, and this is the first race that I've really seen Hendrick Motorsports look good. So if you don't mind, I'm going to take a step back and wait 
to see Hendrick Motorsports do that two or three weeks in a row before I start to say, oh, they're back, and I start to throw them a coming home party. We still got the whole second half of the regular season left to go. A lot of different tracks we're going to the next few weeks. We got some big tracks, got some road courses coming up. You know, we've got a lot of interesting tracks we're going to. You know, this is, there's still a lot of time for Hendrick Motorsports to, to really right the ship, and I'm not ready to say that they've, you know, 100% done that after just one decent race at Charlotte. I mean, they didn't even lead any significant lap. I don't think they led any laps. How can you sit there and say that, oh, we're back and better than ever when you, you know, barely had anybody run top five all night? Come on now. Still, I wanted to give Hendrick Motorsport their credit. I didn't want to come in here and still bash Hendrick Motorsports. I just want to make, make sure people are aware. It's a little early to sit there and say Hendrick Motorsports has figured it out. They're just, uh, they're, they're, it was a good step in the right direction, especially given how bad they were Thursday. I'll give them a lot of credit for figuring it out as well as they did on Sunday, so. Good for Hendrick Motorsports, especially for Jimmy Johnson. I'd be remiss to not at least address or talk a little bit about, some, give some shout outs to drivers that had some, uh, some solid days. To start with, Jamie McMurray. I mentioned how Chevys were good. I mentioned Larson, but I forgot to mention the whole Chip Ganassi team was good. Uh, Kyle, Jamie McMurray was running in the top five for a lot, finished sixth, so attaboy for Jamie McMurray. Casey Kane at one point late in the race was running seventh, and then his car really faded afterwards, but even the fact that he got that little measly little 95 car up in the top 10 in this big race, Attaboy Casey Kane! Alex Bowman in the top 10. I think that deserves an attaboy. I mean, given how awful Hendrick's been this year, or at least how off they've been, you know, for him to be the second highest running Hendrick car at Charlotte and finish ninth. I want to give Michael McDowell a small shout out as well for running in the top 20, top 15 for a large portion of this race. I think he finished 18th, so you know, but a good day. I want to give him a shout out there. And also, I want to give Matt Kenseth and actually the whole Roush Fenway team a small shout out. Matt Kenseth, after coming back at Kansas two weeks ago in his first race running, about basically running 25th all race long and then getting caught up in a wreck, really was disappointing. Go to the All-Star race, they win the pole, and it was like, whoa, great, but then he ran kind of in the back most of the All-Star race, and I think he finished 14th, so it was like, he's still, eh. But we came here to Charlotte, and this was the first race that I feel like Matt Kenseth actually was in control of his car. Finished 17th, which I think is closer to where I expected Kenseth to be finishing with Roush Fenway Racing, and I think it's a small step in the right direction. To go from running 25th, multiple laps down, to then running, you know, in the round 15th to 20th, like he was for a lot, large portion of the race, that's a step in the right direction. So I'll give Matt Kenseth and Roush Fenway Racing, because Stenhouse had a lot of ups and downs in the race to come back and finish 10th. I'll give Roush Fenway Racing an attaboy for that as well. So anyway, those are my little handful of random shout outs. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I'll be back later this week talking about any potential fallout, news, drama for coming out of this race. And then, of course, I'll be looking ahead to next week where we go to Pocono. Pocono, a track I kind of have a love-hate relationship with it. I don't. I think it's a beautiful track. I don't think it really produces the best racing, but it does occasionally give you some sneaky good finishes there from time to time. So oh, we're going to head to Pocono. It's a very different track than what we've gone to so far this year, so I'm excited for that. Uh, thanks to our Patreon sponsors right here with Michael Harrison. Uh, thanks, everyone. You can also become a Patreon sponsor if you check the link down below. I appreciate the support so, so, so much. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Share with the NASCAR fans in your life. Follow me on Twitter, at Dex Racing, for all the NASCAR stuff you'd ever want. And, uh, yeah, thanks, everyone, again. I'll see you in a few days. Have a great week, everybody.